Good morning. I'd like to call this meeting to order. My name is Ann Aiken. I am the acting designated federal officer for NVAC. There are a few things you should know before we get started today. First, this is a public meeting and it's being recorded. All statements made today are on the record. Secondly, this advisory council is governed by the Federal Advisory Committee Act, or FACA for short. FACA provides the rules about the circumstances by which agencies or other officers of the federal government can establish or control committees or groups like this one to obtain advice or recommendations. The voting members are special government employees and are therefore subject to conflict of interest laws and regulations, as are all members who work for the federal government. These members previously provided information about their personal, professional, and financial interests. Each voting member's financial interests and outside affiliation has been carefully screened each year to ensure that they comply with the federal ethics law. The liaison and representatives are non-voting members of the Advisory Council and are not subject to the same FACA rules as the voting members. Additionally, the information provided at this meeting does not necessarily re represent the official position of the National Vaccine Advisory Committee or the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Mention of products, processes, services, manufacturers, and com or companies or trademarks does not constitute its endorsement or recommendation by the U.S. government, HHS, or NVAC. And so with that, I will turn it over to our esteemed chair, Dr. Bob Hopkins. Well, good morning. Thank you for joining us for today's second day of our June NVAC meeting. I want to thank you, Ann, for getting us started and to the NVAC team for its work in planning the meeting and supporting the committee throughout the year. I also want to thank the NVAC members and subcommittee members for their dedication to further the work of this committee. In a few moments, I'll provide a brief summary of my thoughts from yesterday's presentations. I really look forward to our presentations for today, and I want to begin with a few housekeeping items. In terms of housekeeping, I want to make sure everyone's aware that this is a public meeting. It's being webcasted on the HHS website. The NVAC team arranged for sign language interpreters to be available on the HHS live stream. We ask that everyone speak slowly and clearly and turn off their cameras when not speaking. This helps the interpreters do their job successfully and helps us ensure that the image of the speaking participant always displays automatically and prominently. For our virtual participants, please remember to mute yourself when not speaking. During discussions, I ask that all members and speakers, virtual and in person, identify themselves before speaking if I didn't acknowledge you by name and giving you the floor. This helps the note taker and others to follow along. Throughout the day, there will be opportunities for committee discussion. If you'd like to ask a question or give a comment, please raise your nameplate if you're attending in person or raise your hand in the virtual platform to let me know you'd like to be called on. As always, members of the public can provide public comment by phone today at 2 p.m. Public comments are not a question and answer session. They represent an opportunity for individuals who'd like to make a comment to do so. The deadline to request a space for public comment or provide written comments during this meeting is passed. However, anyone can send written comments of up to three pages in length to nvac at hhs.gov at any time. Any additional written comments will be provided to the committee members by the NVAC team after the meeting, if needed. Before I review today's agenda, I'd like to briefly summarize my thoughts from yesterday's presentations. We started the meeting with a brief update from our Vaccine Safety Subcommittee, and I want to thank the chairs and the committee members for their work. This committee has had a number of useful meetings and is well on its way to developing its report. During this session, NVAC members gave useful input and feedback and the subcommittee continues to welcome ideas to facilitate progress as the group works toward a final report in the coming months. We also hosted a panel of COVID-19 vaccine safety review. The presentations explored the unprecedented vaccine delivery and safety monitoring for COVID-19 vaccines and documented ways to detect and provide support to the vaccine program. The lessons learned will help to facilitate ongoing efforts in vaccine safety going forward. Current CDC efforts to modify vSAFE for use with other new vaccines in the future are exciting and we look forward to hearing more about this project as it moves forward. We also heard an insightful keynote presentation from the Commissioner of Food and Drugs, Dr. Robert Califf. He highlighted FDA efforts to help combat misinformation. This includes an ongoing high quality FDA scientific review, efforts to help the public understand the science, 
publication of tools to help identify misinformation, and interventions to combat misinformation, including tools such as Prebuttal, which have great promise. The next panel focused on vaccine fatigue, defined as people's inertia or inaction toward vaccine information or instruction due to perceived burden and burnout. Provided data and useful steps to help clinicians overcome vaccine fatigue. Key concepts included strong presumptive vaccine recommendations, use of what else information gathering about vaccine concerns, asking for permission to share pro-vaccine information, and <clears throat> excuse me, and the critical importance of directing fatigued individuals to sources of factual information about vaccines that they trust. An expert panel on clinician care provided us with background, challenges, sources, and potential solutions for burnout and moral injury in providers, and a strong encouragement for providers to participate in efforts to counter vaccine misinformation and malinformation, which hinders our vaccine efforts. We heard updates from our federal agency and liaison members to support written uh, information provided to the committee beforehand. There's a great deal of work in progress to prepare for future RSV vaccination. Strain selection for fall influenza vaccines was announced, and we all look forward to the FDA Advisory Committee guidance on the 23-24 COVID vaccine strains. The final panel of the day centered on the Inflation Reduction Act. Our speakers detailed important first dollar coverage for Part D vaccines for Medicare beneficiaries, and that rulemaking is underway for upcoming enhanced coverage for patients covered by the Medicaid programs. Once again, for today, we have a superb lineup of speakers. We'll open with a panel on vaccines and how they can help curb antimicrobial resistance, or AMR. Then we'll hear from experts about the 100-day mission to end pandemics. Before lunch, we'll have a panel on passive immunization products. And our final panel will speak on restoring vaccination rates. And then we'll again conclude the day with public comments. I came out of order on my public comment slide. Uh, as a reminder, please place the September 21st, 22nd, 2023 on your calendar for the next NVAC meeting and refer to the NVAC website for final details on upcoming meetings. Our first panel for today is entitled Superbugs, Vaccines Role in Stopping the Spread. I'd like to invite uh, our panelists who's in the room to the stage. In this panel, we'll hear presentations about vaccines and the long-term approach to preventing antimicrobial resistance. The session will provide NVAC with an update on progress and barriers to progress, as recommended in a 2015 NVAC report calling for greater consideration of the role of vaccines to combat antibiotic-resistant bacteria. Our presenters are Dr. Paul J. Plummer from the National Institute of Antimicrobial Resistance uh, Research and Education, and on the line, we will have Dr. Lori Hicks from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and Dr. Matus Hasabgasavitz, and I apologize for my mispronunciation, I'm sure, from the World Health Organization. Dr. Plummer, welcome. You have the stage. All right. Well, thank you very much. It's an honor indeed to be here. Um, as mentioned, I serve as the executive director for the National Institute for Antimicrobial Resistance Research and Education, which is a cross-sectoral uh, group hosted by Iowa State uh, that combines the efforts of um, academia, industry, and other affiliate groups and, and government entities into addressing this critical issue of antimicrobial resistance. I also serve as the chair for PACCARB, the Presidential Advisory Council for Combating Antimicrobial Resistant Bacteria, a fellow um, federal advisory committee. So I'm, I'm used to being down there instead of up here, um, but certainly appreciate the opportunity to visit with you today. So uh, let's see, clicker here. Okay, I'm going too quick. So um, my goal in opening this panel is um, simply to kind of level set. I know that this committee has done some work, uh, certainly back in 2015, on, on antimicrobial resistance, and certainly these aren't kind of new concepts or novel concepts to you, but 
Um, really, in the next 10 minutes, I hope to, number one, level set and, and again reiterate the importance of antimicrobial resistance as a global health threat and one that we need to address. Uh, number two, address the importance of vaccines in addressing antimicrobial resistance and disease prevention is key in that process. And then third, give you an update on some of our recent reports from PACARB that I believe would be um, beneficial to you as you consider uh, vaccine recommendations around this. So again, just in terms of level setting, antimicrobial resistance is when these germs, bacteria, or, or fungi um, develop the ability to uh, withstand the presence of antibiotics and their no antibiotics are no longer killed by them. Certainly, antimicrobial resistance is not a new phenomenon. This was occurring well before the uh, discovery of antibiotics. But what has changed over the past several decades is our pipeline of antimicrobials is drying up. And as a consequence, as resistance develops, we no longer have those uh, viable antibiotics that, that continue to kill those organisms available. It's beyond the scope of today to talk about why that pipeline is, is uh, challenged. But if you're interested, there's certainly lots of um, detail on that on the PACCARB website. Uh, to update you perhaps on uh, kind of global burden of antimicrobial resistance as we start to think about this in your panel and, and its importance, this is some data that was released in a systematic review in 2022, so just last year, looking at the global burden of antimicrobial resistance in 2019. And as you can see there, the uh, percent attributable um, or the number attributable was about 1.4 million globally uh, and an associated global attribution of 5 million deaths um, globally. And so that brings it up surpassing HIV and malaria. And certainly, even if we consider t the next year when we had COVID and COVID global deaths, um, these numbers certainly rival those and continue to um, increase. And I believe likely in the next talk, you'll hear about the data that we have that really suggests that the global pandemic with COVID-19 actually exacerbated or, or caused us to lose a lot of ground that we had gained on this issue of antimicrobial resistance. At a national level here in the U.S., our data from the CDC would suggest that 2.8 million infections a year with uh, upwards of 35,000 deaths per year associated with antimicrobial resistance. And those numbers across the bottom, we see increasing rates of uh, resistant organism in a number of different sectors. And again, those have been exacerbated by the pandemic. And so this brings us to a place here where you can see the quote from the, uh, UN, uh, the WHO Director General, but certainly the recognition that antimicrobials really are the bedrock foundation of much of our modern healthcare program, um, including organ transplants, neonatal um, birth survival, um, chemotherapy, all of these um, with immunocompromised patients. And so the absence or the uh, lack of ability to effectively treat infections be due to antimicrobial resistance poses a significant threat to uh, set back our healthcare by um, centuries. And certainly we see a large number of kind of um, headlines that discuss this issue. Um, you know, as is often the case, sometimes these things get sensationalized, but I think we can all appreciate that the uh, global threat of antimicrobial resistance and the problem certainly rivals that of many of our other uh, global threats to health and is one that deserves significant attention and increased opportunities to fund and move forward. So as we think about antimicrobial resistance, we commonly talk about antimicrobial stewardship. And in the context of One Health, which is very much the focus of which both Niamri, where I work, and um, PACARB, where we look at simultaneously optimizing the health of humans, animals, and the environment, we look at the antimicrobial stewardship across each of those sectors. I've pulled out some slides here from the CDC to talk about at a high level those approaches to antimicrobial stewardship on the human sector, knowing that that's a bit more of the focus of this panel. Certainly, we spend a lot of time talking about how do we improve prescription and prescribing practices. And this focuses around the opportunities to um, not only uh, assure that we're selecting the right antimicrobials, but talking about dose duration and the impact of that. However, that's not where stewardship ends. And actually, much of our efforts are focused on 
infection prevention and control. And those are primary areas that we have to focus on in order to decrease the amount of antibiotics that we use and maintain the efficacy of those that we have. And so very much stewardship focuses on these topics of, um, of uh, infection control, hospital-acquired infection prevention, and key to that is ensuring that patients have received vaccines because if we can prevent disease, that decreases the need, obviously, to use antibiotics. So these are some graphics both for providers um, and in the CDC antimicrobial stewardship materials, and then also that we provide patients highlighting the importance of vaccination as a key component of preventing disease and assuring that our antimicrobials continue to work. With that, I'm going to briefly transition to some of the work that we do on PACCARB, uh, as I think that this could provide some resources that will be beneficial to your uh, committee as you review and make recommendations. So the Presidential Advisory Council for Combating Antimicrobial Resistant Bacteria provides the HHS Secretary with advice, information, and recommendations on policies and programs related to antibiotic resistance from a One Health perspective. It was stood up by executive order in September of 2015 as part of a multi-agency approach to combat antimicrobial resistant bacteria. PACCARB's inclusion in the legislation of PAPA solidifies the importance of the council and further recognizes the issue of AMR in public health. A One Health approach is emphasized and utilized in all of our activities as evidenced by our membership, which is composed of everything from veterinarians to um, environmental and crop scientists over to physicians, nurses, uh, and pharmacists, as well as our reports all have a One Health approach. I want to highlight three reports for you that we've published over the last couple of years that I think would be helpful. The first was an incentives report published in 2017. It provided recommendations on incentivizing the development of vaccines appropriate for antimicrobial resistance, along with diagnostics and other therapeutics to combat resistance. This is an evergreen issue, and in this report, we put four strategies to incentivize the development and uptake of vaccines to combat viral and bacterial infections as well as supporting more streamlined interactions among sponsors and regulatory agencies. In 2018, we report, released a report on key strategies to enhance infection prevention and antibiotic stewardship, also including recommendations around vaccines for both humans and animal health. Those recommendations included uh, encouraging the use of novel techniques to design, construct, and produce new products, new vaccines, and pathways for treating, diagnosing, and preventing infections, all of which highlighted the importance of vaccines. We also included recommendations on evaluating current on-farm and production system interventions to target animal production environments, including effective vaccine use, and developing alternative products um, for the control of these infectious agents across the species. And in our most recent report that we just released here in March, uh, uh, focused on preparing for the next pandemic in the era of antimicrobial resistance, PACCAR provided recommendations on product development. Recognizing that a huge milestone in our fight against COVID-19 was the rapid development of a vaccine, it's necessary that we invest in the development of these products and other innovative products before we're faced with our next public health emergency. As they are already difficult to incentivize, we need to have new and innovative diagnostics and drugs in our arsenal prior to when they are needed. So as I conclude, I certainly want to, um, again, commend these reports from PACCARB to you for your consideration. I also would say, you know, again, from a One Health perspective, I would encourage you to think about those um, impacts. Uh, you know, on the veterinary side, I'm a veterinarian by training. On the veterinary side, we're seeing a significant increase in vaccine hesitancy in our animals as well. And no doubt that's related to, um, you know, kind of the concepts that are being passed along um, in, on the human side from the information that some folks are getting. And so as we think about dressing these um, vaccine hesitancy issues, as well as the appropriateness of vaccines, 
working across that one health spectrum so that um, veterinary partners and others are giving similar message and uh, delivering that message so that those pet owners are hearing the same thing they're hearing from their physicians and encouraging those vaccines across the board, I think would be beneficial. With that, I'll conclude my remarks and uh, we'll go to the next speaker. Thank you very much, Paul. Our next speaker is Dr. Laurie Hicks from Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Dr. Hicks, I see you on the, uh, the line. You have the floor. Good morning and thank you. Greetings from Atlanta. And I am the director of the Office of Antibiotic Stewardship at CDC. And I really appreciate the opportunity to speak on behalf um, of CDC and have this opportunity to speak to the committee today. My presentation will be in two parts. First, I'll speak about the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on antibiotic use. And then I'll share some data on how vaccines reduce antibiotic use. And then secondly, I will describe the impact of the pandemic on healthcare associated infections and antimicrobial resistance. And then I'll wrap it up with a brief discussion on the role of vaccines as a prevention tool. Next slide. Next slide, please. So the objectives for the first half of my presentation are to characterize the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and other viral infections on antibiotic prescribing. And I'll discuss how vaccines improve antibiotic use. Next slide. During the COVID-19 pandemic, antibiotic use varied across healthcare settings, but increased with the pandemic waves. And I'll show that, uh, those findings in the next slides. Next slide, please. So this figure shows overall hospital antibiotic use from January of 2019 through August of 2021. Early in the pandemic, hospital antibiotic use increased, but was lower in 2021 compared to 2019. And you can see the orange line, which represents the overall rate of antibiotic use. Now, early in the COVID-19 pandemic in March and April, even though the number of admissions shown in light blue bars fell dramatically, antibiotic use increased coinciding with the start of the pandemic. And while you can see that there have been fluctuations, the peaks in antibiotic use correspond with the times that COVID-19 cases have been highest. Next slide. Now, hospital antibiotic use fluctuations appear mostly driven by the use of azithromycin and ceftriaxone. And these are drugs, as many of you know, that are used to treat bacterial pneumonia. And you can see in those drugs uh, represented in dark blue and light orange, respectively. And as COVID-19 cases go up in March and April of 2020, and again during the 2020 and 21 winter, so does azithromycin and ceftriaxone use. And we've been looking at data through the end of 2022, and we're seeing the same patterns of increasing antibiotic use during the COVID-19 peaks, even through uh, the more recent peaks. Next slide. So now let's transition to the nursing home setting. And I wanna just say that the nursing home setting story isn't that much different from what I just shared related to the hospital, but overall nursing home antibiotic prescribing decreased during the pandemic. Uh, the orange line reflects the number of residents receiving antibiotic prescriptions per 1,000 residents in nursing homes from January of 2019 through August of 2021. And antibiotic use was 5% lower on average in 2021 than in 2019. And this decline may be attributed to decreases in the resident population during the pandemic, which you can see represents presented by the gray line. Next slide. Despite the overall decreases in antibiotic prescribing, nursing home azithromycin and ceftriaxone prescribing increased in 2020 and 21 compared to 2019. And the peaks are most notable here for azithromycin. And you can see that uh, represented by the blue, dark blue line. Ceftriaxone is represented by the light orange line. 
azithromycin use was 150% higher in April of 2020 and 82% higher in December 2020 than it was in the corresponding months in 2019. Next slide. Now moving to the outpatient setting, you can see that overall number of outpatient antibiotic prescriptions plummeted in 2020. You can see that represented by the orange line, but prescribing rebounded in 21, 2021, and that's represented by the black line. And the significant decline in antibiotic prescribing compared to 2019 likely reflects a number of factors, including in changes that um, occurred related to healthcare utilization, decreases in transmission of non-COVID respiratory infections for which antibiotics are often prescribed, and of course, social distancing and other measures that were in effect at the time. However, take a close look at the blue line. In 2022, antibiotic use surged and in the same months um, exceeded pre-pandemic prescribing levels. So you can see that that blue line is exceeding pre-pandemic as well as peri-pandemic prescribing. Next slide. So I'm going to have you take a closer look at 2022, and the different lines here represent different age groups. Um, we'll focus in on that orange line, which represents the under 20 population. And what I want to draw your attention to is that around uh, August, September timeframe, we started to see an increase in viral infections, particularly COVID-19, influenza and respiratory syncytial virus or RSV. And during that time, antibiotic use skyrocketed. Uh, we also observed amoxicillin shortages around the same time. And so while we know that transmission of viruses can be associated with increases in bacterial infections, much of this increase is likely being driven by antibiotic prescribing for viral infections. Next slide. You may consider what I showed you plenty of proof that antibiotics are commonly being prescribed to patients with COVID-19 and other viruses, but in the next few slides, I'll show you what we found when we look specifically at patients who received a diagnosis of COVID-19. Next slide, please. So this study was published in June of 2021 and revealed that most hospitalized patients with COVID-19 receive antibiotics, nearly 80%, and over 80% of those courses were started at the time of admission. Now, over half of patients received ceftriaxone, frequently in combination with azithromycin, and now we're in the process of updating this analysis, and I would say that there have been some uh, very modest uh, reductions in antibiotic use, but antibiotics are still being prescribed for the vast majority of patients with COVID-19 admitted to the hospital. Next slide. So what is happening in the outpatient setting where antibiotics are less acutely ill? And this figure shows that outpatient prescriptions track with COVID-19 cases and visits among adults 65 years and over. Now the gray bars represent the number of COVID-19 case visits, and you can see the number of COVID-19 cases represented by the black line. So COVID-19 visits um, in gray, black line is the COVID-19 uh, case rate. And then the blue portion of the bars represent the percent of COVID-19 visits associated with antibiotic prescribing, which peaked at 33% of visits in November of 2020. And as you can see, many outpatients receive antibiotics when they receive a COVID-19 diagnosis. And most of these prescriptions for, were for azithromycin. Um, I did say that the the cases were the rate, but it's actually the number of COVID-19 cases in that black line, just to clarify. Next slide. Now, uh, as antibiotic prescribing for viral respiratory infections is unfortunately not a new phenomenon, and data from a study conducted 10 years ago showed that 30% of outpatients with a confirmed influenza diagnosis received an antibiotic, while 15% received an antiviral. So I think this is pretty compelling that patients with viruses are more likely to receive antibiotic therapy than they are to receive antiviral therapy. Next slide. 
Vaccines are a key component of any strategy to reduce antibiotic prescribing, and there are many ways that vaccines reduce antibiotic antibiotic use and antibiotic prescribing. Now, bacterial vaccines, as, as you all know, such as the pneumococcal conjugate vaccine, uh, reduce disease incidence and also fear of bacterial disease, which has a direct impact on antibiotic use. And then the next slides, I'm going to share some data on how vaccines against viruses are reducing antibiotic prescribing or have the potential to reduce antibiotic prescribing. Next slide. So here's um, a systematic review and meta-analysis that show that influenza vaccination reduces antibiotic use, and it substantially reduces days of antibiotic use among healthy adults, and probably reduces antibiotic use in children as well. A retrospective study found that increases in influenza vaccination are associated with significant reductions in antibiotic prescribing in the United States, and a 10% increase in the vaccination rate was associated with a 6.5% decrease in population level antibiotic use. Next slide. Now, this is also the case for vaccines that target non-respiratory infections. Rotavirus vaccine also reduces antibiotic use for acute gastroenteritis in children. And the figure on this slide shows adjusted cumulative incidence of antibiotic prescriptions associated with an acute gastroenteritis diagnosis by rotavirus vaccine status. And estimates were adjusted using 12 strata. And the study found that antibiotic prescribing was lower among children who had been vaccinated compared with the unvaccinated population. Now, the researchers estimated that rotavirus vaccine averted more than 65,000 antibiotic prescriptions between 2007 and 2018. Next slide. And not surprisingly, COVID-19 vaccination was also shown to be associated with less outpatient antibiotic prescribing in older adults. This is a Canadian study of older adults with COVID-19 in nursing homes and in the community. And while antibiotic prescribing was common, COVID-19 vaccination was associated with reduced prescribing in the nursing home population, but especially among patients in the community. Next slide. I'll share one last example of how respiratory syncytial virus vaccine reduced antibiotic use. And this was a randomized controlled trial of a, vac a vaccination of mothers in 11 countries. And while the trials pre-specified primary success criterion were not met, RSV vaccination of mothers reduced antibiotic prescribing for their infants by almost 13% over the first three months of life compared to infants whose mothers received placebo. Vaccine efficacy was also observed against prescribing for acute otitis media, which is the most common reason why a child receives an antibiotic prescription in the United States. Next slide. The COVID-19 pandemic demonstrated how a viral pandemic can have a major impact on antibiotic use. Antibiotics are commonly prescribed for patients with COVID-19, even though data have shown that secondary bacterial infections are quite uncommon. And we also know that antibiotics are commonly prescribed for other viral syndromes, such as influenza. Vaccines that target viruses can significantly reduce antibiotic use and improving uptake of existing vaccines as well as new vaccines such as the expanded valent pneumococcal conjugate and RSV vaccines hold a lot of promise for additional reductions in antibiotic use. Next slide. So I'm going to now describe how the COVID-19 pandemic led to changes in healthcare associated infections or HAIs and antimicrobial resistance or AR and the potential role of vaccines in reducing the burden of both of these. Next slide. So HIIs are infections that patients get while receiving healthcare, and they cause substantial morbidity and mortality and are a major threat to patient safety. So CDC monitors HIIs in the United States by using the National Healthcare Safety Network, or NHSN, which are our nation's most widely used HAI tracking system. NHSN tracks multiple types of HAIs, including those listed on the slide, central line associated bloodstream infections or CLABC, catheter associated urinary tract infection or CAUTI, ventilator associated events or VAEs, which include pneumonia and other ventilator associated conditions, 
surgical site infections, such as S they're called SSIs, and selected infections identified by a clinical laboratory test result, including bloodstream infections due to methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus or MRSA and diarrhea due to Clostridioides difficile. Okay, so try to hold on to all those acronyms as I move forward. And in addition, um, uh, HAIs monitored through an NHSN, CDC also tracks AR. So I'm going to have you move to the next slide. CDC issued its first ever AR threats report in 2013, and the report identified a group of key AR pathogens and divided them into three levels, from the highest threat level of urgent, followed by serious and concerning threats. And the report provided national estimates of infections and deaths due to these pathogens. Now, in the next iteration of the report published in 2019, CDC updated um, its methods for generating these national estimates. And more recently, in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, we issued a special report in 2022 assessing the effect of the pandemic on the status of AR threat pathogens. Next slide. So here are the 18 current AR threat pathogens shown by threat level, and I've highlighted those pathogens that are typically considered healthcare associated, although we know that for some of these, such as MRSA, C. difficile, and extended spectrum beta lactaminase producing enterobacteriales, these infections occur in the community setting as well. Next slide. So now we're going to look at the status of HAI and AR prevention before the pandemic. Next slide. These are national data from NHSN in 2019 showing that we were having prevention success. And the figures here depict the standardized infection ratio or SIR for different HAIs over time. And the SIR is a summary measure used to track HAIs that is adjusted for various facility and patient level factors. Now a SIR greater than one indicates that more HAIs were observed than were predicted. And a SIR less than one indicates that fewer HAIs were observed than predicted. And then these figures, CLABC is shown in blue, CALDI in orange, MRSA bacteremia in yellow, and C. difficile in green. The dashed black line represents the 2020 target set by HHS for each infection type. And for each of these infections, the SIRS decreased over this time period, approaching or meeting the HHS target by 2019. Next slide. So similar to what we were seeing with HAIs, CDC's 2019 threat report showed reductions in AR-related deaths, as well as decreases in infections due to several AR threat pathogens, including MRSA and others listed on this slide. So this was good news. Next slide. So although, although these results suggested that the prevention efforts were working, especially in hospitals, the report also highlighted the very high burden of AR, more than 2.8 million infections per year and more than 35,000 deaths, and a critical need for additional action to protect public health. In addition, for selected pathogens that you see on the slide, substantial increases in infections were observed. Next slide. So let's review some data showing what happened with HAIs and AR during the pandemic. So next slide, please. Data from NHSN from 2019 through the end of 2021 shows concerning increases in the incidence of selected types of healthcare associated infections starting in 2020. So remember, VAEs are, vac are ventilator-associated events represented by the blue line, and they showed the largest increases, followed by MRSA bacteremia in orange, CLABC in green, and CALDI in purple. And the horizontal red line illustrates the baseline SIR value of 1 in 2015 for all HAI types. Now, prevention progress was stalled or reversed for three of the four HAI types with uh, 2021 SIRS for all except CALDI, increasing back to or exceeding the baseline SIR from 2015. So increases in HIIs were particularly observed during periods when COVID-19 hospitalizations and cases were highest. Next slide. 
So adding data from 2020 and 21 to the last two vertical bars of this figure that I just showed you, it's clear that for C cauti and MRSA bacteremia, SIRS that had been declining through 2019 increased significantly in 2020 and again in 2021. And in contrast for C. difficile infection in green, decreases continue through 2021, which may have been because of pandemic-related improvements in hand hygiene, personal protective equipment practices, and environmental cleaning and healthcare. So preliminarily, 2020 two data are showing declines in SIRS and the 2022 progress report will be published this upcoming fall. Next slide. Like what we've seen with HAIs, progress in preventing AR in some cases was reversed by the pandemic, and CDC's COVID-19 impact report notes that resistant hospital onset infections and deaths were both observed to have increased at least 15% in 2020, with more than 29,400 deaths from, from HAIs and AR. Um, it's important to note that the burden of AR during the pandemic is prob probably even higher since there were major gaps in data availability during this time period. Next slide. So here's what happened with specific AR threat pathogens from 2019 to 2020. And it's important to emphasize for that nine of the 18 data were simply not available at all. Um, so we did not know whether changes had occurred. But at the bottom of the slide, for those pathogens that had electronic health record data available, you can see that there were pandemic-related increases, in some cases dramatic, in infections, all of which are re important causes of HAI. So very um, disturbing trends that we saw during the pandemic. Next slide. So how do we get back on track and continue to make prevention progress? Next slide. So it's essential to bolster CDC's core actions to reduce HAIs and AR and infection prevention and control practices as well as antimicrobial stewardship remain essential. They're foundational components. However, not every AR infection can be prevented by infection control and stewardship. So innovation is absolutely critical, including investment in developing new approaches that complement existing foundational practices for preventing HEIs and mitigating the spread of AR pathogens. Uh, so these innovations include new therapeutics, better diagnostics, and of course, vaccines. Next slide. So globally, as well as in the U.S., multiple groups and advisory bodies have recommended an increased emphasis on vaccines as part of the strategy to reduce the threat of AR. Examples on this slide include recommendations from this committee in 2016, the World Health Organization, as well as the U.S. Um, National Action Plan for Combating Antibiotic-Resistant Bacteria. Next slide. So although there are no approved vaccines that specifically target pathogens that commonly cause HAIs, there are a couple of investigational vaccines that I wanna share with you that hold promise for the future. One is Pfizer's investigational C. difficile vaccine. It was studied in a phase three clinical trial for prevention of, of symptomatic primary CDI in adults 50 and older. And although, although the vaccine was well tolerated, the trial actually failed to meet the pre-specified primary endpoints. However, in preliminary analyses of two secondary endpoints, vaccinated subjects were noted to have a reduced duration of CDI as well as less severe disease. Another is a Janssen investig investigational vaccine against the major serotypes of an extra intestinal pathogenic E. coli causing invasive disease. And the vaccine is currently be being studied in a phase three trial for prevention of invasive infection in adults 60 and older who have a history of UTI in the past two years. And the study began in 2021 and is ongoing. Next slide. The U.S. experienced significant increases in HAIs and AR during the COVID-19 pandemic. There are multiple potential reasons for these increases, including an overall sicker hospitalized patient population at higher risk for HAIs and AR, as well as staffing shortages, 
and departures from standard infection prevention and control practices that typically help keep these infections at bay. So getting fully back on track to prevent HAIs and AR will require increased focus on foundational fundamental principles and practices, including IPC as well as stewardship. But we are also in need of more innovative approaches to prevent HAIs and AR, such as the development and deployment of new vaccines now and into the future. Next slide. So I'll leave you with this graphic uh, that links the two parts of my presentation together and it describes the many ways vaccines improve antibiotic use and reduce antimicrobial resistance. Vaccines prevent antibiotic use by preventing primary or recurrent bacterial infection, including bacterial infections caused by either susceptible or resistant phenotypes. And the pneumococcal conjugate vaccine, of course, is an excellent example of this. Vaccines against viruses like influenza reduce secondary bacterial infections and also reduce viral infections that commonly lead to antibiotic use, such as bronchitis and upper respiratory infections. Reductions in disease severity also help to reduce antibiotic duration and decrease the use of broad spectrum antibiotics. And vaccines can prevent spread of colonizing and infecting organisms from vaccinated to unvaccinated populations, including resistant pathogens. Lastly, while we don't have any approved vaccines that directly target HAIs right now, vaccines decrease interactions with the healthcare system, reducing the risk of HAIs that are frequently antibiotic resistant. Next slide. I want to thank the patients, healthcare workers, and facilities that helped to report data to us. And lastly, I want to thank Shelley McGill, who helped um, compile the, the slide set, especially the, the second half of the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation, Lori. Our next presenter is Dr. Matus Hasso Agapsovitz from the World Health Organization. Uh, I see you on the screen. Uh, you have the floor, sir. Thank you so much. Good morning and greetings from Geneva, Switzerland. Uh, my name is Matthias Hasa Gobsovic. I'm a technical officer at the Vaccines, Immunizations and Biologicals at the World Health Organization. And in this presentation today, I'm planning to orientate you to some of the key analysis and documents and strategies that the World Health Organization has been working on and publishing that situate us to better understand what is the role of vaccines in reducing antimicrobial resistance. Next slide, please. Firstly, allow me just to summarize using this graph, how do vaccines can actually reduce antimicrobial resistance? There are a couple of ways through which they can do that. Firstly, they prevent infections. They do that both with drug susceptible, but also from drug resistant pathogens. So at an individual level, they can protect you from having an infection from a drug resistant um, pathogen. They also reduce the incidence of secondary infections. So often, you know, following by an influenza and virus, you can have a pneumonia and um, infections. And then if you prevent that initial infections, you can also prevent the secondary infections that may require antibiotic treatments. Because they protect us at an individual level, and if sufficient number of people are uh, being vaccinated, they can also protect us at the population level from herd community from getting sick with these resistant pathogens. And because they protect us at an individual level and at the community level, they decrease antibiotic use. And that decreased antibiotic use and the overall reduction in, in the number of infections associated with vaccines can actually lead to suppression of resistant evolution and then decrease in transmission of resistant pathogens. Next slide, please. And in WHO, we have been um, tackling with three key work streams that really aim to help us to understand what is the role of vaccines in reducing antimicrobial resistance to communicate it, but also to translate it into action, into policy on vaccines, into informing appropriate interventions when we think about which interventions to choose when we tackle antimicrobial resistance, and also to action in countries. So when countries choose, you know, what should be the appropriate interventions to tackle AMR, which vaccines should be purchasing and using and how to use them, this is the aim of this work, to inform some of these decisions. And in order to do that, we had started with um, developing a strategy on vaccines and antimicrobial resistance. We call it an action framework that leverages vaccines to reduce antibiotic use and prevents antimicrobial resistance. This document is a summary of actions that stakeholders, including researchers, clinicians, pharmaceutical companies, NGOs, international organizations, anyone who is involved in the field of vaccines and AMR, 
should take in order to better understand, articulate, and communicate that role of vaccines in reducing antimicrobial resistance. These actions are structured around three strategic goals. The first goal is the need to expand the use of licensed vaccines to maximize the impact on antimicrobial resistance. And here we call for expanding the coverage of, for example, pneumonia vaccines, streptococcus pneumonia, of which the global coverage only is 44%, much below the recommended WHO target of a 90% of global coverage. The second goal is to develop new vaccines that contribute to prevention and control of AMR. And here we think about vaccines, especially the ones that are in late stage development, like for mycobacterial tuberculosis, like for Shigella, and then during the trials of while these vaccines are being developed, we need to ensure that we include AMR-related endpoints into development of these vaccines so that we can collect data on AMR that we can later use for a policy decision, but also a country uptake. And the last one, which is the expanding and sharing knowledge of vaccine impact on AMR. We recognize that still there aren't that much evidence out there, especially at the country level. And we would like to expand that and have more and better evidence on the vaccine impact on antimicrobial resistance. Next slide, please. So having um, developed a strategy on vaccines and antimicrobial resistance, we also wanted to understand what are the vaccines in development in order to tackle the WHO priority AMR pathogens. And last year, we had finalized this analysis. We looked at the clinical development of vaccines against WHO priority pathogens, which are critical pathogens which we need to tackle from the AMR perspective. And what we had found is that there were 61 vaccine candidates in active clinical development, which is activity in at least the last past three years. Um, and we found that the highest number of vaccine candidates was for streptococcus pneumonia with 16 vaccine candidates, TB with 13 vaccine candidates, Shigella with six, and ETEC with six um, vaccine candidates. But worryingly, what we have found is that for these pathogens that are deemed as critical by the World Health Organization and these hospital-associated infections, as um, mentioned by Laurie, worryingly, we don't really have many vaccines in development. And you can see on the right-hand side of that graph for pathogens like um, Acinetobacter baumani or Pseudomonas, there are no vaccines in clinical development, at least for the last year. Next slide, please. So on this basis, on the basis of these findings, we had put together a number of recommendations based on what pathogen we are looking at, what vaccines are being developed for these pathogens, and what is the feasibility of developing that vaccine and then delivering that vaccine to those who need it. So we have classes A to D. The class A is pathogens that already have licensed vaccines, such as streptococcus pneumonia, HIP, and also um, Salmonella typhi, where we recommend to increase coverage of these vaccines and accelerate the introduction, which is especially the case for Salmonella typhi. Class B are pathogens with vaccines in late stage clinical development with high development feasibility, like gonorrhea, like XPEC, C. diff, or mycobacterium tuberculosis. Here we recommend to accelerate development of these vaccines and prepare for introduction. And what I mean by that is to ensure that AMR-related endpoints are included in trials so that we can collect appropriate data to measure vaccine impact. Class C are pathogens with vaccines in early trials or with moderate to high development feasibility, such as ETEC, Shigella, Plexiella, where we recommend to continue development of these vaccines. And while we do that, we develop models, value propositions to better understand what could be the impact of these vaccines on AMR. And the last class, class D, which is the most worrying class, because these are the pathogens that either have a small number or no vaccine candidates in development and also low development feasibility. And here we have Acinetobacter, Pseudomonas, Staphorus, Enterococcus fissium, etc. And what we say here is that for the next five to 10 years, which normally bar COVID takes uh, to develop a vaccine, we need to focus on other interventions in order to control AMR from these pathogens. Next slide, please. And now, in addition to having developed a strategy and having understood what are the vaccines that are in development against some of these priority pathogens, we had also um, assessed what would be the value of existing vaccines and also vaccines in development in reducing antimicrobial resistance. And we did that across three criteria. The first criterion that we looked at was what would be the vaccine avertible health burden of antimicrobial resistance. And what we did is we worked closely with the IHME based in um, Washington, who had last year estimated the 
total burden of antimicrobial resistance. And we were able to get um, pathogen-specific data onto which we had applied, developed, what will be vaccine profile? So how a vaccine would look like for us in Entobacter Bomani? What will be the expected coverage? What will be the expected efficacy? And we did that for a number of vaccines in our assessment. For some, this is known, like for um, MTB, we know the late stage candidate M72, we know what properties, attributes such a vaccine would have. For some, it's purely hypothetical, like for us in Entobacter Bomani. And then we were able to apply these assumptions onto the IHME data and estimate what will be the potential impact of these vaccines in terms of reducing the total number of deaths and infections that are associated with um, resistance. And what we had found, just the top three pathogens, is a vaccine, a streptococcus pneumonia vaccine, that has a better efficacy in protecting against low respiratory infections, could actually avert around 122,500 deaths associated with resistance. And a vaccine against mycobacterium tuberculosis, which would be given to infants, uh, with an 80% efficacy um, would avert around 120,000 um, deaths associated with um, resistance. And these are preliminary results that are available as a preprint, and they will be published in BMG Global Health in the next two weeks, and I'm happy to forward the publication to the committee. Next slide, please. In addition to analyzing the first criterion, which is the vaccine-averted health burden, we also wanted to understand what will be this vaccine impact on averting the antibiotic use? And here we had conducted a number of systematic reviews in order to understand for a given syndrome, what is the antibiotic use associated with that syndrome? And then for that syndrome, what is the breakdown of, and contribution of various pathogens to that particular syndrome? Um, and that allowed us to calculate antibiotic specific use associated with these pathogens and then apply the vaccine scenarios that we had previously delivered to be able to calculate what proportion of the antibiotic use could be averted by a vaccine. What we had found, we found that a TB vaccine, which is actually not shown on this slide because it squashes all of the bars that we see on this graph, would have the largest impact in terms of reduction of antibiotic use between 1,200 to 1,800 million doses, defined daily doses. And then we saw that the second highest was group A streptococcus and then followed by um, staph aureus between 70 and 60 million defined um, daily doses in 2019. The purple bars here reflect um, an infant um, children under five population if we were to be vaccinated. The yellow bars is the incremental impact of such a vaccine if we were to be administered in the elderly um, population. Next slide, please. And lastly, for the third criterion, in order to understand the impact of vaccines on antimicrobial resistance, we also wanted to calculate what would be the vaccine impact on reducing the cost of treating um, resistant infections, so analyzing the economic burden. And again, we had conducted a number of systematic reviews to better understand what is the length of stay associated with number of hospital-associated infections, what are the treatment costs associated with these infections, and again, we had linked these with the vaccine profiles that we had previously developed and also the averted health burden criterion to be able to calculate if we would have a vaccine for E. coli, for example, what will be the averted hospital cost of treating a resistant pathogens from that vaccine? And you can see that on the right hand side, this is a breakdown by pathogens and also by colors is a breakdown by WHO regions. What we had found is that the total potential, so if we have vaccines for all of these pathogens, we could avert over $33 billion um, in 2019 um, in terms of hospital costs for these pathogens. Across regions, its staff aureus vaccination resulted in the largest hospital costs averted, around $14.5 billion, followed by E. coli at around $5.7 billion. And um, all these three criteria, so the health burden, the antibiotic use, and the economic burden are now being written, and there will be a WHO report on estimating the value of vaccines in reducing AMR that will be published later um, this year. So you have uh, early insights into some preliminary data that will be available um, later. Next slide, please. And with that, I just wanted to acknowledge a number of people, a number of colleagues who have contributed to this analysis. This analysis has been going for quite a few years now and with really huge efforts from a number of collaborating centers and universities. So I would like to thank you for that. Thank you very much, Matus. I want to thank all the members of this, uh, this panel. Uh, clearly, the antimicrobial resistant 
space is one in which uh, uh, vaccines and a number of other interventions are critical in, in stopping this challenge. Are there any questions or comments from uh, either any of our members on the line or in the room? Sure, Steve, please. Hey, thank you so much for sharing that information. And I think when people look at vaccines, reducing antimicrobial resistance is not something that comes to their mind, but a huge part of it. Your talks really made me think about the what's happening now with the RSV front. Um, I mean, RSV is the leading cause of hospitalization in kids under 12 months, and not to mention the burden in the office. And I was wondering, I haven't studied the clinical trials that were done with the RSV vaccines, but do you know if decreasing antibiotic use in the vaccine group versus the placebo group was looked at in any of those? That would be a fascinating um, endpoint to look at. The, the study, the trials may not be big enough to have enough power to look at that, but uh, something I think would be interesting to see at some point. Yeah, so this is this is Laurie Hicks. I, I mentioned one study um, that was a multinational study, but it was the vaccination of mothers, not child, the, not the infants themselves. And um, there was a marked reduction in antibiotic prescribing to infants, even though it was the mothers who were being vaccinated. So I, I am not, I don't know about the data related to um, the more recent uh, vaccines and the vaccines that are being considered for use here in the United States, but I, um, I would imagine that, and I, I would predict that there would be an, an impressive impact on antibiotic prescribing. Um, we, we certainly saw uh, during that fall increase last year, which included RSV as one of the leading um, viral pathogens, that there was a very um, impressive increase in antibiotic use among young children. And so I would suspect that a lot of that was due to um, transmission of RSV and, and especially in the community setting. I think a lot of the um, clinicians who treat uh, bronchiolitis in hospitalized um, infants know that antibiotics are not going to help, but in the outpatient setting, it's not uncommon for children just to be given an antibiotic um, in a just-in-case measure. Matus, you have your hand up. Sure. Apologies. I didn't know what the protocol was, whether we are um, referred to by chair. So um, this is correct. So for RSV, there was this clinical trial that was conducted where mothers were vaccinated with an RSV vaccine. And then as children were immunized and protected against um, RSV, they observed a reduction in antibiotic use of around 13% of the vaccine group comparing to a placebo group. Similarly, in our analysis, where we had modeled the impact of an RSV vaccine on potential antibiotic use, we saw a reduction in defined daily doses. I can't remember from the top of my head what it was, but it was definitely a reduction, significant reduction in defined daily doses. And just to note that this was also observed for other viruses. So Joey Leonard from Berkeley University had conducted analysis where he looked at the impact of a rotavirus vaccine in reduction of antibiotic use, and he saw significant changes in um, significant reductions in children um, under five in low middle income countries. It was around, I think, 18 million um, antibiotic treated episodes per year. And also there are a number of observational studies that are looking at reductions in antibiotic use um, following um, influenza vaccination. Over. Thank you. Daniel Hoft. Thanks, Bob. Um, great uh, presentations. Um, I have two uh, questions. The first one is maybe for all three of the speakers. Um, and that is, I'm just wondering about uh, the role of what I, I'm thinking of as collateral damage in terms of thinking through how to prioritize what vaccines uh, in this space we should be really prioritizing. What I mean by that is um, a pathogen that has broad um, uh, impact globally 
uh, and specifically needs to be treated for long periods of time, uh, you'd think would, would potentially have a bigger impact on collateral damage in terms of antimicrobial resistance and other pathogens. So I wonder if there's any information on that concept that can help us um, in terms of recommending uh, prioritization. The second um, uh, question is very different and maybe more uh, appropriate for Dr. Hicks. Um, I'm just wondering about the increases in antibiotic um, use during the pandemic, whether or not there's a relationship between telemedicine uh, versus in-person visits and overuse of antibiotics. And should that be an area we focus on for, for research and trying to uh, develop um, information that would make physicians more comfortable or other uh, types of ways to try to minimize that if it's associated? Thank you. I'm happy to, oh. to tackle the second question. I don't know, um, do you wanna, I'm happy to go first with that second question and then I'll hand it over. Um, so you're absolutely right. Uh, there were um, a lot of changes in how healthcare was delivered during the pandemic, including increases in telemedicine. And, I, and while telemedicine increased access to healthcare, which is a great thing, um, we did see instances of where antibiotic use increased for specific conditions. And one example is uh, group A strep pharyngitis or pharyngitis in general. Um, Basically, what we saw, and, and there was one health system in general, in, in particular, that we were working with, um, Intermountain Healthcare out in Utah, and they saw during the time that they switched to telemedicine that their patients who had pharyngitis weren't being tested routinely for uh, group A streptococcal infection, and so they, um, there, there was a dramatic increase in antibiotic prescribing for patients with pharyngitis. And I would say that that would be um, a, a, a fairly universal uh, challenge that we have with, um, with telemedicine is that uh, access to, to necessary testing, um, you know, access to the tools that help us make a decision about antibiotic prescribing may not be as readily available. And I'm just using that as one example, but that was very, that's a, that's a very um, important observation. And so we're working very closely with the telemedicine organizations and companies to develop standards for stewardship in, in telemedicine. I'm happy to tackle the first question. Go ahead, please. Sure. So in terms of pathogen um, vaccine prioritization from the perspective of antimicrobial resistance, what I have presented were the three criteria, so the health burden, the antibiotic use, and the economic burden. What I haven't shown, given the time constraints, there are some also additional criteria that one could look at in order to prioritize what should be the appropriate vaccines to invest in in order to reduce AMR. And one of them, what we call is um, the sense of urgency to develop AMR um, interventions. And what we captured here, what we described there is additional considerations such as, you know, what is the pandemic potential of a pathogen? What are the remaining treatment options? What is the slope of developing resistance? And how likely is it that either now or in a couple of years time, we will have no options to be able to treat that particular pathogen? And an example that actually, it, you know, comes very really prominently because of this criterion, but not for the others, is Nesera gonorrhea, where we currently, we don't have a huge mortality. Uh, it's not a huge economic burden, neither it is associated totally with, with high antibiotic use. But if you think of this sense of urgency and how many treatment options we have left, it's actually a very limited number. So because of that, one should prioritize it. You've also asked whether we take into account um, the length of um, infections and the length of treatment in that prioritization. And I think inevitably that comes, you know, when we think of a, antibiotic use criterion and when you um you know calculate what is the total antibiotic usage over that course of treatment you know that inevitably then makes that particular pathogen come to the top and we saw that for mycobacterium tuberculosis for which treatment you know it, it's very long it takes six months and we can see that that is associated with the highest number of antibiotic usage and then subsequently and um, the averted antibiotic used by a vaccine over so I'll make a couple of comments. Um, certainly echo the, the comments that were made before. Um, 
two things I would add. First, on the telehealth question, I, I think it is clear that um, delivery of health care and, and new mechanisms does have an impact on prescribing and, and potentially on um, the appropriateness of prescribing. And so I would suggest PACCARB, we have spent a lot of time on that topic, and, and actually I think we have online um, our our meetings are public and they're recorded, and so you could go to the uh, Pack Carb website. But we spent at least half of a day in one of our recent meetings um, having testimony around the impacts of uh, telehealth on antimicrobial prescribing and potential impacts on antimicrobial resistance. And so, both from CDC, but also from you know some of the large health networks um, and how they are working to address stewardship in that um, in that space. And and here again, I would say that also impacts um, One Health because we see that transmission in, in veterinary medicine as well. And and just last week um, or this week saw the transition of all over-the-counter antibiotics to prescription only here in the U.S. For, for some of the veterinary antibiotics that were still available over-the-counter. Uh, in terms of the first question, I, I think the collateral damage is a, is a great um you know, point to make, and I, I think one additional challenge that I would uh, emphasize there, and, and this is in the peer-reviewed literature, it, you know, is that even when we bring products to market, sometimes access and equity of that access across the globe is challenging. So, um, you know, when we bring forward um, perhaps a new class of antibiotics in one of our developed countries, in many cases, getting that out into other parts of the world where it might have a large impact also has the potential for um, less oversight of use and, and perhaps in some cases different uh, resistance selection measures. And so as we think about those vaccines, I think there's the component of both um, you know, how do we incentivize and move forward those vaccine developments, but then how do we, um, you know, really improve access into the most critical areas where those vaccines, an example, you know, on the TB side or, or some of those others, how do we make sure there's incentive to have those available elsewhere as well? Thank you. There's one additional question that's come in through the chat from Rob Schechter. Uh, asking if there are any indications whether the deferred or decreased immunization rates that we saw in this country in the first couple of years of the pandemic contributed to increased antimicrobial use. I'm not aware of any evidence there. I suspect maybe CDC would be the place that would have data if it's available, but I'm not sure. Yeah, so this is Laurie. I think one of the challenges is that um, early in the pandemic, we saw a decrease in antibiotic prescribing. And I would suspect that some of the rebound uh, phenomenon that we're seeing um, kind of in the later stages of the pandemic and, and more recently probably does have something to do with de decreased immunization, you know, allowing for increased transmission or increased severity of disease. Um, but I'm not sure how we're going to measure that. Uh, but but I, I think it's a very important point and um, just speaks to the importance of trying to increase uptake of, of existing vaccines to um, improve antibiotic use. Well, I want to thank the members of this panel. It's been uh, very helpful and instructive. We're now going to turn to our, uh, our next panel, uh, Vaccines and the 100-Day Mission to End Pandemics. Our, our presenters for this uh, uh, panel are Melanie Seville from the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, Thomas Quinney from the International Federation for Pharmaceutical Man Manufacturers and Association, Tanya Holt and Jennifer Heller from McKinsey and Company, and Catherine Bowles from the Rockefeller Foundation. Will those members that are, are those presenters that are in the room go ahead and take the stage and we'll let uh, Ms. Seville have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, just want to check start, to start off with whether people can hear me clearly. We hear you, you are loud and clear. Great, thank you very much. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here with you, but also with um, my fellow fellow pal panelists who really have, um, I think, between um, all of us, will really present a number of different angles as to um, the 100 days mission to end pandemics. 
Um, what I will start off with is really an overview based on the work that has been, been done by CEPI and also um, really looking um, across the whole ecosystem and feedback um, from developers, uh, public, private partners, um, uh, broadly across the ecosystem as to how to get to the 100 day mission. So if we could move to the first slide. Um, I think really the very first thing to point out is um, really the lessons learned that we have uh, can take from the COVID-19 pandemic. And this slide just shows you um, really the unprecedented speed of vaccine development for COVID-19. What you see at the top here is what would normally happen or even perhaps is rather ambitious for um, de development of a vaccine against an, a new um, infectious disease where usually it can take decades um, to develop a vaccine, um, going through the various stages of development through to filing, registration and use. And what we saw in COVID-19 was really quite extraordinary. You can see here that the first vaccine um, was first use uh, or emergency use authorization just 326 days after the sequence was published. And you can see here, looking at the various um, phases of development, how they had been cut um, or cut back and really stripped back quite considerably. Um, although this is extraordinary, there is, you know, the thought of what if this could have happened in just a hundred days? At that point, it would have been in April 2020 when there were only 2.3 million cases of COVID-19 as opposed to December, where there were already 68 million cases um, identified. How much more of an impact could vaccines have had? Next slide, please. I think it's important to say there is a key message of something that happened for COVID-19, and it wasn't by chance. It was actually due to decades of work done previously that could come together in the context of COVID-19. And this just element, this just illustrates a couple of those key elements. First of all, work that was done for previous coronaviruses, for SARS, for MERS. And just as an example, CEPI has been working with the University of Oxford on their CHADOX platform for MERS, which allowed um, the Oxford team to immediately pivot to, um, to work on COVID-19. And all of the immunogen design work done by people like Barney Graham in VRT um, were also really instrumental for being able to move forward fast, but also with candidates that could be uh, effective. The second key element here is um, the development of rapid response platforms prior to the pandemic. So there had been decades of research with mRNA and other rapid response technology, um, which meant that that um, these could finally be validated in the COVID-19 outbreak. Next slide, please. And then really the last thing to mention in relation to COVID-19 is the importance, if you're really looking to move um, forward very rapidly or the 100-day mission, the importance of having end-to-end -end mechanisms that go all the way from the beginning of R&D, all the way through, through licensure, through procurement and through delivery. And COVAX was set up in the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and CEPI was one of the founding members together with Gavi, WHO and UNICEF to set up that end-to-end -end approach to make sure that uh, vaccines were available to those most at need, um, irrespective of where they are around the world. And I think the figure now is uh, nearly 2 billion doses of vaccines have been delivered with a strong emphasis on low and middle income countries. Next slide, please. So then moving on from the pandemic, um, CEPI uh, took on a piece of work together with McKinsey um, of interviewing across the whole ecosystem of, um, of COVID-19, R&D, uh, the regulators, the downstream partners to really understand what were the innovations that took place in COVID-19 and what further innovation could take place um, uh, with additional uh, innovations and additional work. Um, and this really all contributed to the 100 day mission um, where we want to be in a position where from the start of development uh, to 100 days, 
that a vaccine is available for first use and at manufacturing scale. Next slide. So this then nicely illustrates a little bit further some of the output of that work. Um, you can see here various different scenarios. You can see again the traditional scenario where vaccine development is done in sequence um, with increased investments over time in manufacturing. And what you saw with COVID-19, where you began to see um, various stages of development and manufacturing all happening in parallel rather than sequence. So a lot of upfront investment, in particular in manufacturing, before you knew whether or not you had a candidate, and trying to compress some of the stages of development. What we heard through the interviews was if you took everybody's innovation from COVID-19 and put them all together in a development, take advantage of all of the work that had been done upfront, you probably could compress the timelines somewhat further. But if you want to really get to 100 days, just by compressing things and doing things quickly, um, you cannot um, get to the 100 day mission. So we're really talking about a paradigm shift in the way that you do um, vaccine development. And the key important factor here is that you do as much as you can up front prior to the outbreak development of technologies, development of innovation, uh, doing as much preparedness as you can up front. The second piece is 100 days is a short period of time, and it's not all over at 100 days. The importance of the continued development, the continued manufacturing, the continued ge data generation to ensure that you have safe and effective vaccines. Next slide, please. So this is really summarizing uh, a, a really a huge number of innovations that came out of that exercise. You can see here, we've put them into five categories. Actually, perhaps number five needs to come first to make sure that the global capacities for early characterization of pathogens in outbreaks is really critical to get vaccine development going. Um, but you can see here, there are some key elements and I'll touch on, on, on some of these in separate slides, in particular on the notion of vaccine libraries um, and the importance of networks. Manufacturing needs a special call out here and ensuring that you have a globally distributed manufacturing to ensure that all populations, no matter where they are around the world, can um, receive a vaccine in an equitable manner. It's not just all about the research. You obviously need to work with, an, with regulators, with policymakers, and obviously make sure that the financing architecture is also present in order to make these advances. Next slide, please. So this just gives you the notion of working upfront um, on virus family vaccine libraries. There are approximately 25 virus families um, with, with viruses known to infect humans. So the approach here is really building on the approach from BRC of um, looking at a virus family and sampling viruses widely across the various genera of a virus family. Some may be animal viruses that can spill over, others already human. And this is an example of paramyxoviruses where you have the uh, penipoviruses, including Nipah that we know causes outbreaks, but in other genera, you have measles, you have rubella. Um, and so sampling those viruses on the immunogen design, on rapid response platforms, taking them through preclinical and clinical testing so that you have a library of vaccines and reagents that you can take on off the shelf and just adapt very quickly as a new related virus emerges. Next slide, please. Um, and then just the importance of networks. Um, Steffi is looking at building networks, networks of manufacturing, um, uh, for manufacturing, laboratory networks, animal model networks, and making sure in all of the regions that the clinical trial networks are uh, available and have the tools necessary to respond rapidly to conduct clinical trials in an outbreak situation. Next slide, please. Um, this, this looks complicated, but this shows you that no two outbreaks are, are going to be the same. Um, and you really need to think about scenarios and what scenario you are in. 
And this brings together the key critical factors that um, we came up with more than 54 scenarios in terms of a potential outbreak. And you can understand that not every outbreak requires a response in 100 days. It really depends on the benefit risk assessment of any particular outbreak to know what sort of scenario you're in and what sort of activities you need to conduct in that situation. Next slide, please. So that has resulted in CEPI's plan to prepare for pandemics in the future. Um, it brings together the 100 days mission around three key, key um, objectives um, around preparing for the next pandemic and using known um, epidemic and pandemic threats to learn more and more and also to practice more and more for future outbreaks. To transform with innovation, with working on, on vaccine libraries, and to make sure that we connect with others who are working in the same area to pool the resources and pool the knowledge available. Next slide, please. And this is my last slide, and it's just a reminder that this is 100 day mission is not just about the R&D and about the innovation. It's about an end to end process. And the objective to the 100 days is to have vaccines that are available and are equitably accessible to the populations most at need. And the importance that downstream partners as well have to consider what does the 100 day mission mean to them. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Melanie. Our next presenter is Thomas Quinney from the International Federation of Pharmaceutical Manufacturers Association. Thank you very much. Uh, IFPMA is the organization which represents the companies which basically developed and manufactured more than 80% of the vaccines used by Curvax. And we just heard from Melanie how important Curvax was for developing countries. In terms of how was this possible, and Melanie already mentioned some dates, please next slide. I think what we have seen during the COVID pandemic is the largest partnership ever in terms of everybody tackling a public health emergency. It was, I think, extraordinary that this was possible within the 326 days Melanie mentioned. It was only possible because science, innovation and collaboration worked. But we have also, you know, seen the ups and downs of innovation. Nowadays, when I look at the public debate, everybody talks about how much money a couple of companies make. Not many people talk about the 300 projects of which only 10 led to a vaccine. Everybody talks about a lot of public investment which went into vaccine development. And when you look into it, I think it's really absolutely beyond doubt without BARDA in particular, and BARDA much more relevant than anybody outside the US in terms of scaling up at risk played a big role in many of the vaccine developments, also advanced purchase agreements played a role. But we also need to bear in mind that, for example, in therapeutics, most of the at-risk funding was done by private companies. We also, when we talk about our joint ambition and the industry fully embraces the aspirational goal of doing it even faster next time round, we need to be realistic. COVID most likely will have been the exception rather than the rule in global pandemics. When you look at the seven cases where WHO declared the public health emergency of international concern, six of them, I would say, were orphans. Sika, Ebola, swine flu. They were really orphans where you didn't have hundreds of small and big companies all working 24 seven out to find a cure. And honestly, one of the reasons why COVID was the exception, it hit us, whether it's you in the US, whether it was us in Europe, hard and fast. And the biggest impact in terms of lives lost was, you know, in the rich countries. But Looking at that, I think we really need to 
built on the multi-stakeholder partnership, which worked. Melanie mentioned the Act A partnership. We, IFPMA, were a founding partner of the Act A partnership. But as said Barclay yesterday in Madrid during the Gavi midterm review said, basically during COVID, we had to build the ship while we were already sailing. Hopefully, if we want to be faster, we can set and establish the architecture, global health architecture, but also the partnerships before we sail. Next slide, please. When I look at actually how it worked, we also, and no disrespect at all, Melanie to Seppi or to Rachel Tatchett and you, I really came to respect the great work and the preparatory work that Seppi had done. And I noticed that companies which before were rather apprehensive or reluctant to team up with an organization like as yours, but at the end of the day, when you look at which vaccines really not only worked, were effective, it was basically vaccines developed by two biotech companies, BioNTech and Moderna, not really that well known, not that many people uh, had expected that mRNA would be the game changer, the breakthrough, which it was. But also when you look at which companies delivered best and most effectively, it was when you had partners. And it was when you had partners, BioNTech with Pfizer. It was when you had Oxford University with AstraZeneca or Moderna, for example, with the contract manufacturer Lonsa, one of the largest and most seasoned CRMs in biological production. Therefore, I think it's extremely important that we continue to rely on the innovation ecosystem which made this work. And we last week, for example, in Geneva, had an event which caught a lot of attention where we had pairing. We had five innovative companies, Merck Sharpendorm, J&J, AstraZeneca, uh, Pfizer, and, uh, and Gilead talking about them partnering with their partners and we are the CEOs of BioVac, of Ferrazon, of Aspen, uh, uh, of Fiocruz, all talking about how did this work out. I think one of the lessons learned with all the debate, for example, on IP or TRIPS waiver is that the partnerships which worked were business to business. One of the representatives there, Stavros Nikolaou from Aspen said, literally within five days from having the first contact, we signed the contract with AstraZeneca. This was only possible because we had known each other for years and we had worked with each other for years. And this was the message from every single representative because the issue in terms of know-how sharing, tech transfer goes far beyond the license. And that cannot really be cursed. Uh, next slide, please. When we look actually at what worked, you know, a lot of people, me including, we were all frustrated that we had the inequitable rollout. And the inequitable rollout, when you look at it to quite some extent, was based on COVAX was betting rightly that low cost manufacturing at high quality in India and Pune would by and large supply Africa. Therefore, when you had the surge of COVID in 2021 uh, in India and Prime Minister Modi shot the border from one day to the next, Africa was basically left for seven months without vaccines because the US didn't share upfront most of the contracts signed by companies, manufacturers in the US, they clearly indicated no exports before July. Therefore, when we look at what worked, we need to make sure that the pathogen sharing, which was never questioned, works as fast in the next pandemic, that the innovation system, which delivered so well, is maintained. And we also need to maintain the extraordinary deeds of regulators, whether it's FDA, whether it's EMA, whether it's WHO regulators, they really work 24-7. But we need to focus on what didn't work well. For example, COVAX initially, 
I think Melanie was kind in uh, not, uh, you know, attacking anybody. But Kovacs suffered from a lack of funding. They were second or third when it came to advanced purchase agreement because they couldn't sign them before they had the money in the bank. We were confronted with export uh, bans or trade barriers and SEPI and we in in March 21, we co-hosted the Chatham House Roundtable, tackling and addressing the problem of shortages, trade barriers, and we also need to do better on country infrastructure readiness, because we saw once we had sufficient vaccines, we still struggled to get them into the arms of the people. Next slide, please. And in particular, we also need to make sure that the multi-stakeholder system, which was developed, works upfront from day one. And we need to work on the inequitable rollout. I did mention Africa. When you look at the angle we meet from African countries, it's clearly that we need to support John and Kenga Song, who said when he was CDC Africa, CDC head, we need to aspire to have 60% local manufacturing by 2040. But he will be the first one to admit that this is aspirational and not a done deal because the enablers, skilled workforce, sustainable demand, and many other strong regulatory systems are not there yet. That's why in terms of future pandemic preparedness, we, for example, in our lessons learned, we said we too, industry has a responsibility in terms of doing better on equitable rollout. That's why industry leaders a year ago when they came together in Berlin committed in the Berlin Declaration to put aside part of available manufacturing in real time for use for priority population in low-income countries. This commitment has since then been embraced by the developing country vaccine manufacturers and by bio the small biotech companies. But all of us know it will only work if even the richest countries in the world commit to sharing and allowing exports of this part before every American or European or British citizen is vaccinated. That's why we really need to embrace a social contract. I'm pragmatic and realistic I would never expect that country leaders will say, look, I'm totally committed to equity around the world. That's what they elected for. That's what they swear the oath of allegiance for. But social contract to share part of that for priority populations, whether it's frontline healthcare workers or the elderly, should be feasible. Last slide. And with this in mind, I do believe that the thriving innovation ecosystem, us already now, innovative companies teaming up with CEPI, for example, on prototype vaccines for priority pathogens, us working on establishing a network beyond, you know, the US, uh, India and Europe can do the job. Us also looking into some of the bureaucratic hurdle, for example, in terms of how many tick the box you need on good manufacturing practices. We can never compromise quality, but I think it is a realistic aim that we should work towards even faster in the next pandemic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas. Our next presenters are Jennifer Heller and Tanya Holt from McKinsey and Company. Thank you so much for having us. And the focus uh, that we'll be diving deeper on, which both Mel and Thomas have, have already alluded to, is on vaccine manufacturing. So as, as we all know, preparing for the next pandemic is a top priority for national public health leaders everywhere around the world. And part of that you know, requires laying the appropriate groundwork and foundation to mount an effective vaccine response. And COVID really exposed a bunch of gaps specifically in the vaccine supply chain side of the equation. And so creating those more resilient vaccine ecosystems will be critical for readiness. And so the insights that we'll be sharing today were compiled together by talking to a range of stakeholders, um, such as vaccine manufacturers, policymakers, academia, regulators around the world to really understand what it will take 
to move the needle here. So I think, you know, as we think about, you know, the transformed vaccine ecosystem that we're walking into now out of the COVID pandemic, there's four major shifts that we've seen occur that will have implications for building that resilient ecosystem. First, as Mel articulated nicely earlier, the time to market horizon has dramatically changed. Whether that is sustained, I think, is an open question, and certainly we won't get the 10 months that we've seen previously, but we will see something shorter, assuming that some of the learnings are adopted more broadly. Second, we've seen a real change in the competitive landscape. Um, you, as we know, the, the players that came to the table to respond to COVID were not just the big pharma, but the innovation was coming from all over the ecosystem with a lot of the smaller biotechs. Uh, it was actually interesting, the last time I was here speaking at NVAC was in 2019, where we were talking about what it would take to spur innovation in the vaccines market. Well, we've seen one of those uh, is a pandemic. And so that's, I think, one of the other pieces here that we want um, want to highlight. Production capacity, huge investments in this space, and we've seen you know, dramatic capital deployment to build capacity globally. And then that brings me to the last point on this page, which is that has also been part of the onshoring strategies for a lot of, of countries who are thinking about how they can bring back some, reverse some of the trends we've seen and bring back manufacturing capacity into their domestic borders. So as we think about five steps that have surfaced from our findings and the perspectives that were shared from industry leaders around the world, we see five steps that emerged. And I think it's important to note that it will be critical to balance current needs, short-term pressures that, that governments and public health leaders are facing, and the longer-term objectives for building vaccine resiliency as you think about how these steps um, will be deployed. The first one is thinking really about how do you quantify and define what a resilient vaccine ecosystem should accomplish. And there's dimensions here around the types of, of pathogens you're ready to respond to, the different modalities that you're using, the scalability of those, and the time in which you're able to, to expand your capacity. The second step is really around evaluating what your local manufacturing base has based on the objectives you've set for your resiliency programs and initiatives. And that will include dimensions of ease of access, how quickly can you access and easily access the, the technology and the um, manufacturing availability. Second is how flexible that will be to scale up across different types of pathogens, different types of vaccine modalities. And the third is how reliable is that? And my colleague Tanya will go into more detail on some of these in subsequent slides. The third step is really around identifying the capabilities and gaps that you have in your vaccines ecosystem from a manufacturing perspective. And one of the key learnings I think coming out of COVID on this front is it's not just the vaccine manufacturing itself, but it's also thinking about how you gain access to more segments across the value chain that will build that resiliency in. So looking backwards into the raw materials and some of the supplies needed to actually manufacture those vaccines, looking forward as Mel was mentioning into some of the clinical trial networks and how you can actually ensure that you have the access already built up um, to those, and also thinking about data. Do you have the right data to quickly identify pathogens and be able to sequence them and move quickly to manufacturing? So I think there's, there's a broader set of capabilities and gaps than just the manufacturing itself, although that will be core as well. The fourth step, uh, which I, I think is, is something that both of the prior speakers have, have alluded to, is around the capabilities to coordinate ecosystem stakeholders across the public sector, across the private sector, and across academia. And that will allow you to enable access to investment needed. It'll also be critical in developing some of the domestic capabilities as you look forward. Other dimensions here include components of you know, building your talent pipeline and ensuring you have the right 
the right um, you know, folks available to step up as needed during a response, that you have the tech transfer capabilities domestically built out, and with the right stakeholders collaborating on those, as well as the data and analytics to enable some of that. And then finally, the last piece here is around investment and collaboration and thinking about how you put the right incentives in place for industry to continue to step up to the plate in the event of a pandemic or beforehand in preparing for that, as well as collaboration across countries um, with, you know, with, with, for example, like Access Consortium, right, which is a longstanding consortium that puts countries together to collaborate on these types of initiatives, but also thinking about more inf informal collaborations across countries um, that, that can la later on turn into formal collaborations for forecasting of data and demand and ultimately purchasing uh, collaborations as well. So I think a lot of different dimensions here. But I'd like to turn it over to Tanya to now pick up some of the threads around assessing the capabilities needed. Yes, thank you, um, Jennifer, and I hope my line is, is clear for, for everybody to hear and understand. I'm dialing in from London here. Um, I, I wanted to pick up on the, the comments on the 100 days from Mel and from Thomas uh, around, you know, how do we how do we really ensure readiness? Of course, in, during the pandemic, we saw an, a significant increase in the manufacturing capacity globally. Um, but if we are to reach the 100 days uh, and reach the 100 days in our population in an as equitable manner as possible, one of the key things that we've looked into is what is the readiness of our manufacturing and the resilience of our manufacturing capacity globally? Um, and I think as we as we reflect back and we look at this now, it does become a, a bit clear that one thing that stand out is perhaps one of the it was we knew less about going into the pandemic was really the state of the manufacturing landscape in the world. Um, and so what do I mean with that? I mean, uh, where was the different manufacturing sitting? How much was available? At which technology? What was the degree of flexibility that we had available? Uh, where was the different input supplies actually sitting globally? And um, many people in a very short period of time during the pandemic tried to create that more diagnostic fact base as to understanding those factors. And, and so as we think uh, into the next pandemic and the preparedness, we believe there's a real opportunity for especially public health leaders to do the evaluations clearly as to what do we actually have and what is the degree of readiness within our manufacturing. Um, and so we, what we looked at, and this is a very simplified version of that, is just to look at saying, you know, what is the required uh, supply that I need, depending on different types of outbreak that may be and the different demand strategies that a country may choose to deploy for different situations. And then really assess it against three factors here. One is what we would call the uh, accessibility factors. And this is, of course, you know, how much is there? How many of these may we have APIs with? May we have different type of reservation capacities with? But having a very clear view of how much of this could I actually potentially access? And what is the timeliness by which I, I could access that capacity that I have available uh, within my country? The second thing is then really around the, the reliability. And of course, this we saw play out in the pandemic as well. Um, do I actually uh, have uh, the hot capacity? Is this um, warm capacity or is this cold capacity? So how can I, much can I rely on this will come up and running in a very short period of time when I need it? Um, this would be the second set of assessment we would uh, propose. And then the third is really as it relates to the production uh, ramp up. So from the moment uh, I am in triggering how fast will I be in order to get uh, the first doses available uh, in the different countries. Um, and we think that if each country, and actually also globally in different networks and collaborations, could do these level of, of assessment, we would have a much better sense of where could we actually uh, produce at which point in time and where does some of the uh, vulnerability uh, on this topic set uh, globally. We go to the next page. Um, the, the second things we, we looked into quite a lot that we believe is an area for certainly further research is really around the degree of flexibility. 
um, because there will, of course, be certain countries that have access to all the different uh, vaccine technology and manufacturing platforms, and there will be other countries that may actually have to choose which ones to have in their countries and which ones to partner around. And we believe that as one does these assessments, it's very important to begin to uh, this degree of flexibility. We believe there's three degrees of flexibility that allows uh, one to uh, adjust the investments a country or a manufacturer may do. One is really the more basic and the classic as it relates to, to the ramp up itself, uh, which is really you know, ramping up increasing production volume within a particular platform, may that be uh, an mRNA or et cetera. And how much of that flexibility can you have within a factory, within a country, et cetera. The second one is then what we will call the intra-platform uh, flexibility. And how can we put more innovation and research into increasing this particular one where you may actually swap from a production of a vaccine A into a vaccine B, and how do we reduce the time that it would take to do that kind of intra-platform that we may have in a steady state uh, a COVID vaccine being produced, but then there is uh, an outbreak and a new vaccine comes out and we are very rapidly able to switch that production capacity into these new vaccines. And then the, the third one is uh, really what we will call an inter-platform. This is perhaps where we see least today, but where there are real uh, investments coming in and perhaps more investment would really increase the flexibility in our system, where we are able to perhaps swap from a production of a viral vector into an inactivated uh, virus vaccine, for example. So these are the degree and the type of assessment that we would uh, encourage for more analysis to do more collaboration globally, so that we have a much better uh, assessment of where we uh, where we start. Next page, please. The last thing is, is of course, this uh, the conversation around the geographical uh, distribution of having distributed network and a real uh, sense of when do you, you sort of make this capacity available within your own country, whether it is attracting potential uh, onshore footprint expansions, uh, expanding on existing domestic footprint that is already available to build up the resilience that's needed. But there's, of course, also the possibility of really, we call it buying, but it may rather we call it collaboration, to engage into to global markets, which is to what Mel was explaining around the COVID part of the idea underlying some of those um, elements there. So really three aspects of uh, increased global slash regional collaborations that we see and that we think that work for further uh, investigation. One is of course the um, uh, the ability to 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 more jointly look at the demand forecasting. Um, and I think we saw it more recently on the monkeypox outbreak, where clearly the combined volume of doses were not nowhere near what we saw during the COVID pandemic. But at the same time, we had different demand needs in very different parts of the world. And any ability to 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 go together and and estimate those jointly will increase our um, our flexibilities. The second, and I think Thomas touched upon this a little bit, is really as it relates to the supply chains and the transparency uh, on the supply chains, which is perhaps even less than the transparency that we have today on the manufacturing platform. Where do the different raw materials come from? Who is holding what and what volumes? And how do we ensure a much higher degree of flexibility and perhaps trading between different manufacturers? in particular moments of crisis to ensure that the input supplies are available where they're truly needed. And, and then the last is uh, a bit of an allusion into to, to COVAX and the opportunity in the global and regional population to really have a slightly better collective bargaining power and create a, a better ability to shape the markets by having larger volumes, in particular for some of the smaller countries for whom it may not be feasible to have all the production capacity in their own countries, but it will come through the increased collaborations. And yeah, so to, to sum up on this, and I'll hand back to my colleague, is, is really, I think, more of a call to increase the research that's going into the manufacturing, to increase the collaboration on this space, both within the industry, but certainly between industry and also um, the public sector for greater resilience on, on manufacturing. Thank you. Thank you both very much. And our final presenter in this panel is Catherine Bowles from the Rockefeller Foundation.
Thanks, everyone. Hi. I want to share a little bit of the story of the Rockefeller Foundation's experience and contributions to the global vaccination efforts, particularly in low- and middle-income countries. And actually, the, the Foundation's history in vaccine development and rollout goes back to the 1930s with yellow fever. And in the early days of the pandemic, the foundation mobilized and invested $23 million in something called the Equity First Vaccination Initiative, which was working through local community organizations in the U.S. addressing the racial disparities in vaccination rates. And so this initiative really focused a lot on building trust, and that's something we heard a lot about in yesterday's sessions. And by late 2021, <clears throat> when we began to see that vaccine was available in adequate supply in low- and middle-income countries, there were some similar issues around equity and equitable distribution, and we heard some of that in the previous speakers as well. Vaccines were sitting in capital cities. They were, <clears throat> they were unused. They were expiring. They were reaching some populations and not others. And so safety, quality, which vaccines were better than others were all questions that many were asking. And it resulted in very little equitable distribution. And so we began to look at how we can focus on particularly getting vaccines out to those most vulnerable populations in the communities that needed them most. Vaccines are really nothing if they're not becoming vaccination. <clears throat> and so to address some of the inequities and barriers, we first looked at four Ds, dollars, deployment, digitization, and demand. And, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sorry. At the time in early 2021, there wasn't enough resource really to deliver the vaccines across the country, particularly in priority populations. There were logistic and regulatory challenges, and there just wasn't enough money or planning to get the vaccines from the capital cities out. And the deployment challenge really looked at both supply and workforce. Cold chain, transport, training, personnel, those were all needed to deploy the vaccines to communities, and the resources were insufficient for all of those both supply and workforce issues. And so what we saw were hundreds of thousands of vaccines that were undelivered. They expired. In many cases, vaccines were returned. And a third big piece was also the digitization and the digital infrastructure that just wasn't there to support tracking vaccine rollout, tracking doses required for the most vulnerable populations. We saw this in the U.S. as well. And so linking vaccination status into existing health records was also a big challenge. And finally, demand. This was a huge gap area, needing resources to better understand the contextually appropriate tools, approaches, and just the messaging for populations. There was mistrust, there was mis- and disinformation, you'll recall that, both in the U.S. as well as around the world, and even among healthcare workers. What we needed was tailored, evidence-based approaches to social and behavior change, and this was really a missing element. And so this is a quick slide to just show a snapshot from July 21 and the global status of vaccination. And at the time, you can see 14% of the whole world population had completed the primary series of vaccination, and only 1% in low- and middle-income countries. And even today, this is an unresolved issue. We have around 63% of the population completed the primary series and only 25% in LMICs. And so the Rockefeller Foundation launched what was called the Global Vaccination Initiative, and this was an investment of around $50 million over a two-year period. And <clears throat> I want to show this slide simply to show you the framework in which the very focused efforts around demand that guided and is guiding our work. There are, you know, building on the U.S. work, we wanted to look at 
five key areas in which we felt that we could contribute to those global efforts. And one, investing in networks. And we heard a little bit about this earlier with the manufacturing uh, conversations and the importance of networks and trust even within key leaders. And so bringing leaders together within and across countries to share real-time lessons and problem solve the challenges in those countries. Secondly, we supported existing data platforms. And I say existing for a reason because there were so, so many that were introduced. And not introducing any new ones, but really reinforcing and expanding the capacities within those digital platforms to track vaccination uptake and demand. And third, we really heavily invested in communications from everything the related to one-on-one -on -one home visits with a provider, a trusted messenger, to mass online messaging through SMS and social media. Underlying these were influence and institution building that really helped us look at sustainability of some of these lessons to support vaccine uptake and demand, whether it's any vaccine or really any essential health service as we've seen. And I'll give a few examples of that. So we're about a year into the work, and we've seen some incredible early successes. We've also seen a lot of challenges. Um, you'll see a few of the examples on this chart of the successes, and the pie graph is uh, a depiction of the 14 countries in which we're currently working. I'll just highlight a couple of these. One is that first bullet of 64 million persons reached. It's a huge number, but there's a lot of story behind that. For example, in Kenya, there is a popular radio DJ with a listening audience of around 650,000. And the majority of that audience self-reported as unvaccinated completely and hesitant. And so a two-month campaign through this DJ's championing vaccination brought about a 9% increase in the listening audience of complete vaccination. And there are a lot of little examples like that in which the communication investments really saw significant change. We're also looking at a number of pieces of research in 17 countries around social and behavior change in general, certainly for vaccination, but also for essential health care. And that work should help inform not only what happens with vaccination, but also well beyond this pandemic and looking at some of the next threats as well as routine care. There are a few other examples on this slide of our ongoing reach and impact. It's still, as I said, we're about halfway through this work. And just quickly on the network's objective, one particularly important network that is now transitioning to Africa CDC is the vaccination Outwork action network called VAN. And this is running in Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, Malawi, Zambia, in Zimbabwe. <clears throat> and this is a group of, within each of these countries, subnational health leaders who are getting together and sharing their experiences, particularly with COVID vaccination, uh, and also problem solving and developing solutions together. And init initially, these sessions were only about COVID vaccination rollout. And now they have become much more about the most pressing health concerns in each of the countries. And sharing those lessons and challenges, solutions across, has resulted now in 10 different interventions, projects in the countries in which they're working, that are being rolled out now by community-based organizations. So this is a model that we think doesn't just serve us well during the pandemic, but is an opportunity to bring fora of subnational local leaders together to define their solutions together and share them. And then just a, a couple more slides. I was recently in India visiting some of our partners' work, and this slide is an example of the, the real focus on addressing now the most vulnerable populations, so the elderly, those with comorbidities, the, in this case, transgender communities. The lesson that we're hearing from our partners is that COVID vaccination can be linked to other priority services that are likely 
even more important to these populations. And so that's kind of the benefit of, for example, in some of these photos, the populations are coming for diabetes screening, for cardiac screening, treatment for high blood pressure, um, food baskets for communities in nutrition poor areas, and also providing a COVID vaccine. So integrating services into vaccination efforts is a theme that I wanna leave you with. Um, trying to do this work um, and, and impact demand for COVID vaccine is quite challenging. And so on this slide, you'll see on the, a few of the reasons that are most relevant uh, in an assessment that we conducted about a month ago with our partners. So these are the key reasons why demand is waning and why it's particularly challenging. And in the photo and the quote you see on the slide as well, one of our partners is responding to the cyclone after effects in Malawi with the displaced, in the displaced camps and in HIV clinics, and using that as an opportunity to also offer COVID vaccination. And so integration is probably a word some of you have heard about with respect to uh, COVID vaccination and indeed other essential health services. <clears throat> it's kind of a new buzzword. Uh, it's something that we're all better trying to understand. How, when, where, with what populations, at what frequency, with what personnel do we link COVID vaccine to another essential service? COVID is endemic and something we should, one, be regularly addressing when and as protective boosters are available and are equitably available, and two, we should be ready to mobilize quickly should a new variant become more severe. So you see on this page a recent definition from WHO and UNICEF of integration, and then clarification a bit um, just in the last couple of weeks by our partners doing this work. And notably, our partners are looking at the distinction between integrated and integration. So intentional integration into the right set of services with the right populations is really the way forward. And it may help us address some of the challenges that we heard about yesterday with other vaccination efforts, such as HPV. What are ways to really sustainably integrate this work into what we all see as essential care for, out for ourselves and cohorts around the world? So, Three more slides that I'm just gonna show you that reflect our early investments in integrated work. And so this is just um, a quick depiction of along the WHO health system building blocks, which we felt was a good frame for us to look at where and how different partners are almost organically integrating COVID vaccination into other services. And so service delivery is one. And you'll see a few examples here in which service delivery is integrated with either other vaccines into an adult platform with routine immunization for children under five, sexual and reproductive health care services, non-communicable diseases, HIV, et cetera. And then here are a few examples of the health workforce, capacity training, support on social and behavior change messaging, and on the importance of identifying what those essential services are and how and when or how often the population should receive them. And then health information systems. We're doing a lot of support looking at integrating these records into DHIS2, into NCD screenings, for example. And I was recently in Cambodia as well. And Cambodia is a gold standard of COVID vaccination efforts. Many of the population are on their fourth and fifth boosters. And so now is a perfect opportunity, which is what they're doing, to build this work into primary health care. Not vertical campaigns anymore, but linking to adult platforms, NCD screening, when you come in for a regular checkup and you're your local health worker knows and lets you know that it's time for a checkup. You receive all of the services that you need in a more holistic fashion. And so that's all quite exciting, very nascent work. 
And just to leave you with a photo, um, this is a picture that I took recently in Assam, which is northeastern India. And these are health workers who are boarding a makeshift raft, and they're trying to get to the community across the river to deliver vaccines. And this image really captures the resilience and the need for preparedness that allows for continuity of services when, as in this case, there are constant shocks, flooding during the monsoon season, the main road is inaccessible. And so how we build this learning into preparedness for any health emergency, any climate impact is what Rockefeller Foundation is really beginning to think about and a move toward um, a comprehensive look at how to support and mitigate the impacts of climate um, not only is reflected in this work, but is now going to be a part of everything that we do. And a slide from Cambodia really shows also to me, I think, the need for integration. You can see one of those containers, cold storage containers of vaccines, came through COVID money and is nice and clean, and it only stores COVID vaccine. And the other one stores the more the dirtier one, closer to the floor, stores everything else, every other vaccine, every other thing that needs refrigeration in this clinic. And so I think the, the plea here for us is to think about using those same resources. How can we not only integrate our services, but also our priorities and our funding streams and our personnel to share, to improve efficiency, cost, and quality, and scale. And so I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you very much, Catherine. You know, I think as I reflect on these presentations, you know, the 100-day mission is a starting point. You know, it's not the end point. And, you know, all of these preparedness efforts from beginning of research through preparation to manufacture at large scale to the regulatory piece to getting vaccine out to getting vaccine in arms, all of those have to be linked efforts. And... We have to think about it from the demand side on the, on the population to the thought side at the beginning if we're going to be successful going forward. And I want to thank all of you for your presentations. Are there any comments or questions from the committee members either in the room or online? Not seeing any. Thank you all very much for your presentations. You've given us a lot to think about. Uh, we are now at 11.10 or 11.11 11, uh, Eastern Time. Let's take a short uh, five-minute break and we'll come back for the preparing for potential approval of passive immunization products. Thank you all for joining us. Produced by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services.